You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Cindy Johnson, copy editor for USLHS Publications and chapter leadership committee member of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Cindy. (laughs) Hi, Jeremy. Today is May 29th, 2022, and this is episode 175 of Lighthearted. In a little while, we will hear a conversation with Lauren Nelson, site manager of Michigan's oldest lighthouse at Fort Gratiot. This episode will be released during Memorial Day weekend, but we're recording it a week or so earlier. And I've spent a lot of time at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse the last couple of weekends, which mm-hmm. is, of course, as you know, very well know, is pretty close to my, my home here on yes. the New Hampshire seacoast. And a uh, few of us spent much of uh, Saturday last weekend, most of the day on Saturday, painting the stairs inside the lighthouse, the ladder to the lantern room, the uh, railings on the walkway to lead out to the lighthouse, and we painted the storage shed. And uh, really got a lot done. It was a great crew that day. Lots uh, of interior painting in the tower looked like. Yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, our mutual friend and also uh, sometimes co-host of this podcast, Michelle Shaw, of course, was a uh, part of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, a few other uh, great volunteers. I, I don't think I'll, we have the time to name everybody, but thanks uh, to anybody who's listening. Thanks to everybody who helped out with that. Absolutely. And then, then today I went back and spent a few hours painting the lantern room floor and walls and a few other miscellaneous surfaces here and there. And, Just you uh, on your own painting. Yeah. Painting inside the tower of the lighthouse. That's kind of neat. Yeah. When I finished, I realized it was completely fogged in. You couldn't see a thing from the lighthouse. Oh, wow. It was a little spooky in a way. But it Lighthouse was cool. weather, we call it. It was, you know, I, I was thinking about it as, as I was painting today, I was thinking this is really special, really cool to be in this very historic structure, an 1878 lighthouse on the site of the first lighthouse north of Boston, which uh, was uh, built in 1771 at Portsmouth Harbor, to be able to uh, do hands-on work like that in, uh, in a place where so many keepers years ago, put so much of themselves into it, so much work into it. Keepers like Joshua Card, who was there 35 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, Henry Cuskley was there like 26 years. And then Elson Small, uh, whose wife Connie wrote the great book, The Lighthouse Keeper's Wife, et cetera. And these, you know, to think that I'm painting the same walls that those guys painted years ago, uh, just uh, I felt it was uh, pretty special. It is really special. I always say when people ask if the lighthouse is haunted, and as you know, as you very well know, we have stories about that subject. I always say that if people choose not to believe that the spirits of the keepers are are literally there, then uh, they're at least figuratively there and they inspire us every day. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was, yeah, that was you today. And you thought that you you said you've got some uh, paint still on your hands and and arms to prove it. (laughs) Yeah, I sure do. I think it's going to be years before I get it all off. I'm not. I I did get some on the walls, too, though. I I tend to get a lot of myself along the way. But anyway, so that was uh, that was fun. Painting Uh, floors and, and, you know, cast iron spiral staircase steps. That's that's no easy task. No, not for somebody as uh, messy and clumsy as me. No, it's not. But, <laughs> but, but it's it, but it's also enjoyable. It's tiring, yeah. but it's uh, I find it very enjoyable. But anyway, just uh, before we move on, I just want to say a little bit more about Portsmouth Harbor Light. We have tours starting this uh, Memorial Day weekend. The weekend people are going to be hearing this. We start uh, with tours on Friday evenings and Sunday afternoons. Tours by reservation only. People can reserve uh, the tours through our website, PortsmouthHarborLighthouse.org. And I'll be giving some of the tours. Our Again, our friend and co-host, uh, Michelle Jewell Shaw, will be giving some of the tours. And sometimes we'll be giving them together. So like I said, we just uh, have done a lot of painting to make the lighthouse look nice. But uh, the walkway, the 84-foot walkway that leads out to it is in uh, very much in need of replacing at this point. That's right. Uh, And to help raise funds for the new walkway, there will be a June Jamboree event at the Kittery Lions Club uh, right up in Kittery, Maine. On the afternoon of Saturday, June 4th, uh, there will be live entertainment and free pizza. 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, several uh, pizza places have uh, pledged pizzas for us. So that's, that's uh, great. That is great. We'll also have a silent auction with uh, some really cool prizes. Of course. People can read about the event. And as I said, our tours, again, I'll mention the website again, PortsmouthHarborLighthouse.org. There's going to be uh, some uh, Irish uh, dancers from a, a kid's uh, Irish dance school in Dover, New Hampshire, and also a fun uh, musical group called the Honey Badgers. Uh, so, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's fun. I hope to see some of our listeners there. And I just want to mention, too, for people who can't make it to the event, if you want to help out with the uh, the walkway, with the fundraising for the walkway, there's also a GoFundMe page we just launched, just launched yesterday, and it's doing pretty well. So if you go on GoFundMe and search for Portsmouth Lighthouse, it's pretty easy to find. There's also a, a link uh, to it on our website. Right. There are also two Sunset Lighthouse Cruises coming up on June 17th and June 24th, leaving from Rye Harbor in New Hampshire. Yep. I'll be narrating those cruises. They will go near three local lighthouses. Again, all the details are available at PortsmouthHarborLighthouse.org. So, Cindy, please help me tell everyone about Fort Gratiot Lighthouse and today's guest, Lauren Nelson. Sure, Jeremy. With the 1825 completion of the Erie Canal, which linked the Great Lakes to the Hudson River and the Atlantic Ocean, maritime traffic in the Great Lakes increased dramatically. As the canal was being completed, Congress appropriated funds for a light station near Fort Gratiot in the southern portion of Michigan's Thumb. The fort, at the juncture of Lake Huron and the St. Clair River, was built in 1814 and was named for Charles Gratiot, the engineer who supervised its construction. When the light station was established at Fort Gratiot in 1825, it was the first light station in the state of Michigan. The original 32-foot tall tower fell after being damaged in an 1828 storm and it was soon rebuilt, with the new tower first lighted in the spring of 1830. The new brick tower stood 69 feet tall. In 1862, an addition raised the height of the lighthouse by about 20 feet. A steam-operated fog signal was added to the station in 1871, and a new duplex house was built a few years later to house a principal keeper, an assistant keeper, and their families. The Coast Guard vacated the light station with the construction of the new Coast Guard station, Port Huron, built in 2004. In 2010, ownership was transferred to St. Clair County Parks and Recreation. With funds from the city of Port Huron and other sources, some restoration work was completed and the light station was opened to the public in 2012. Port Huron Museums operates the site and the Friends of Fort Gratiot Light also work for the preservation of the lighthouse and other buildings. A recent grant from the Michigan Lighthouse Assistance Program will enable St. Clair County Parks and Recreation to hire a consultant to rehabilitate the Lighthouse Tower's watch room and lantern room. Lauren Nelson is the site manager of Fort Gratiot Light Station for Port Huron Museums. I had the pleasure of speaking with her recently. Let's listen to that conversation now. I'm speaking today with Lauren Nelson, who is the site manager of the Fort Gratiot Light Station for Port Huron Museums in Michigan. Thank you so much for joining me today, Lauren. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. First of all, how did you come to be the site manager at Fort Gratiot Light Station? Well, uh, it's an interesting story, actually. After I graduated from undergrad at Western Michigan University, I worked for a little while up at the Mackinac State Historic Parks. And one of my jobs up there was actually interpreter at Old Mackinac Point Lighthouse. Ah. And that is when I remembered that I really liked lighthouses as a kid. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then I went to grad school at Central Michigan University. And every time I got a chance to, I would do a project or write a paper about Michigan lighthouses. Mm -hmm. uh, and my advisor noticed that when he had uh, a lunch meeting with the current director back in, oh gosh, 2017. She asked, you know, are any of your students, would they be a good fit for the site manager for the lighthouse? And apparently I sprang to mind. Uh, so I got incredibly lucky and I started at what is a dream job, honestly, three days before I graduated. Wow. 
that does wow. not happen in this field. So uh, yeah, well, that, that that is really fantastic. And by the <laughs> way, I was just in Michigan for a week. I was hoping to visit Fort Gratiot while I was there. Didn't make it, but uh, did visit uh, well over twenty lighthouses uh, in the week. And one of them was Old Mackinac Point. So I know that's a a unique and beautiful lighthouse. That must have been a nice experience working there. Oh, it's a beautiful lighthouse. Most, you know, most lighthouses around the Great Lakes are entirely functional. Yeah. But that one is just architecturally very neat. It's like a that, little castle. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a Norman revival kind mm-hmm. of style and it's very pretty. It is. It really is. I, I enjoyed myself so much on that, that trip. And by the way, uh, before we started the official interview here, we were chatting about the weather a little bit and I was telling you how it snowed some days uh, while I was mostly in the UP during that, that recent trip, but it was 75 one day at the 40 mile point lighthouse. So, uh, we think we have extremes, you know, extremely changeable weather here in new England, but I think you guys got, have got us beat by quite a bit. We do. Um, here in Michigan, you have to plan to wear three layers and shorts in the afternoon. Um, the weather's incredibly changeable and that's, mm-hmm. I think partly due to the lakes and that's often underestimated is how powerful those lakes are yeah. uh, at affecting weather. Yeah, yeah. It just blows me away. I'm mean, in two different locations where we were on the trip. I saw people surfing on Lake Superior, which I had never given much thought to before, but I guess it's not it's not unusual to you, I'm sure, to see see that, but I was kind of uh, surprised. Yeah, here on Lake Huron, we don't see too many surfers I, there are some wind surfers there's lots of kayaking uh, but up on lake superior with those big waves absolutely yeah yeah i have to uh sometimes stop and and uh think you know remind myself that it's fresh water and not the ocean but that's there's always something in the back of my mind that's telling me that all the time because i don't smell the salt air so that yeah. kind of <laughs> clues your brain in sure looks like the ocean it anyway sure so back to your your job there uh at the fort grash at light station what what kinds of things uh, does your job entail sure um so i do like the day-to-day operations that's what the uh the port huron museums do this is actually a county park they own the buildings they do all the maintenance and all the restoration work it's all county parks which is great because that's the hard work and i don't want to do it um, but we just run it every day. So we do uh, guided tours throughout our buildings. We do educational programs. We do rentals, that kind of stuff. Um, We also have a museum store. I'm here five days a week, just making sure the lights are on, Mm -hmm. floors are swept, that kind of stuff. We also have a a large group of volunteers. So I schedule and recruit them. I manage the museum store, do all the purchasing for that. And then in all my free time, I get to do research and uh, create new exhibits. <laughs> huh. I'll bet that's a lot of fun for you. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you do a, a bit of everything, but it sounds like a great job. So I was uh, reading about Port Huron Museums, which manages the light station. I believe the organization also manages the Huron Lightship. Do I have that right? Yes. So that is one of our four historic sites. The Huron Lightship is uh, about a mile south of the... Fort Gratiot Light Station. Mm -hmm. Um, It's actually buried in the riverbank, so it's more or less dry docked. Is it open for touring? It is. Um, So they have the, they're on the same schedule as the lighthouse. Right now we're just open on weekends during the summer. We do seven days a week and you can go tour the light ship. The site manager there is incredibly knowledgeable and will give you a three hour tour if you keep asking questions. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Uh Um, it's really a treasure. Uh, it was the last light ship stationed here on the Great Lakes. Yeah. Uh, it was built in 1920 and was active for 50 years until 1970. Uh, it's actually a National Historic Landmark now. It was the only light ship to remain on station during World War II. It oh, was wow. that important. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That is impressive. And there's only about a dozen surviving, maybe a little bit more than that, surviving light ships in this country. So. Sure. Yeah. It's so. the only one in Michigan. Yeah. It's great to see it being so well taken care of. Absolutely. So, so what other sites does uh, Port Huron Museums manage besides the light station and the light ship? Uh, we have two other historic sites. Our main museum is the Carnegie Center. It's an old Carnegie library downtown. And that's more of your local uh, history, traditional local history museum. And then the Thomas Edison Depot Museum. This was a train depot just south of the Fort Crash at Light Station, where Thomas Edison actually worked as a young man. Hmm. Uh, he spent his childhood here in Port Huron. He was not born here, and he left pretty, pretty early, but 
uh, he, that was his first job was at the uh, Thomas Edison Depot there. Of course, it wasn't named that at the time. It was right. just the uh, Grand Trunk Railroad Depot yeah. station. That would have been quite a coincidence if it was named yeah. that when he was a <laughs> young man who worked there. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know about that. So if we could uh, talk a little bit about the name of Fort Gratiot, and I had to double check myself before we did the interview today to make sure I'm pronouncing it right. When I say Fort Gratiot, am I saying it more or less correctly? That is absolutely correct. Yep. Okay. And I took uh, three years of, uh, not college, but high school French. Uh, So my inclination is to think it's a gradio or something along those lines more of a French pronunciation, but why, first of all, where does the name come from and why is it pronounced the way it is? Um, There's a lot of French names here in Michigan and we don't always pronounce them the way they should be. Gratiot actually came from Captain Charles Gratiot, who was an army engineer who built the actual military fort just south of the flight station. Uh, It was built in 1814. Yeah, from your high school French, it probably should be something more like Gratiot. Right, that's better than what uh, I said, yeah. He was he was American, and we don't pronounce things correctly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is a lot in Michigan named after Gratiot. There's a road here in Port Huron called Gratiot. There's also a Fort Gratiot. It's a township just north of here. So there's there's a lot sharing that name, and all mm-hmm. of it's pronounced the same, which is incorrect. Forgive me if you have already said this, but I'm not clear on uh, Fort Gratiot. Is there anything of that fort uh, remaining today? Yes and no. So uh, Fort Gratiot was built in 1814. This is the last year of the War of 1812. And if you pull up a map of the Great Lakes, you'll notice um, right here at the bottom of Lake Huron, the St. Clair River starts, is a strategic choke point. Um, So if you're able to control the boat traffic coming through this very narrow channel right here, you're able to control everything that goes on in the upper Great Lakes. Uh, You can't get to Superior or Lake Michigan until you come through here. Right. Um, so the Americans built a fort here in 1814 so they can kind of control what ships uh, are coming through here. Mm-hmm. Uh, just across the St. Clair River from us is Canada. That was British at the time. Of course, the War of 1812, the Americans and British were fighting again. So just in case they tried to attack from this angle, that fort was here to protect it. That fort was garrisoned um, until 1821, at which point the tensions between the two countries kind of fizzled out a little bit. In the 1820s, it was actually leased to um, a missionary school. So there was a school here that was teaching both uh, European-American students and uh, local Anishinaabe students as well. With some of the Native American uprisings going on in Wisconsin in the late 1820s, 1830s, actually regarrisoned the fort and completely rebuilt it. That was an active fort until 1879, at which point they... uh, abandoned it. They just didn't need it anymore. Most of the fighting is going on further west in the country. Uh, so this was not a strategic area anymore. So they uh, abandoned it, tore down some of the older buildings, and they actually sold some. There is one building that we know of that still exists from the fort, and that is our uh, Fort Gratiot Post Hospital, hmm. which was moved in the uh, early 2000s to a park next door to the Fort Gratiot Light Station and is actually included in our tours. Okay. So we have this original post hospital that's part of our tours. We've restored the outside to what it looked like in the 1830s when it was built. Yeah. Uh, the inside, though, is a work in progress. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, we have the one building, uh, but where the fort actually was, the original site, unfortunately, it's been developed. There's a big hotel there now. We have a culinary school and some apartments right there. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the hospital building because I wasn't clear on what that was. But uh, Yeah, um, not technically part of the Fort Gratiot Light Station. Um, it's in a separate park, but just right next door. So it is included right. in our tours just okay. because we do share that history. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. So obviously it's a very strategic location from everything you just said. Uh, so you've partly already answered my next question, but why was a light station needed at uh, the Fort Gratiot location? Or there, there must be additional reasons besides uh, what you've already talked about. Sure. I actually have a really good quote from, uh, this is from Alexander Thompson, who was a commanding officer at the fort uh, in the 1820s when that first lighthouse was built. So the quote is, All the property from Lake Superior, Huron, and Michigan, together with much from the Mississippi going both and coming, 
uh, passes through this channel. And there is not on any of our lakes a more necessary situation for a lighthouse than near the mouth of this outlet. And he puts it really well. There are three great lakes emptying into an 800 yard river. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of water coming down here. There are actually rapids under the Blue Water Bridge currently. It's a very swiftly moving current. It narrows very quickly from Lake Huron into the St. Clair River. Uh, And there's a very narrow channel through which any boat can go. Um, It gets, you know, shallow on either side. And I think that speaks to that strategic location right here. There's so much ship traffic coming through, especially with the opening of the Erie Canal. You really kind of need a lighthouse here. (laughs) Right. And the Erie Canal opened in 1825. Do I remember that right? Which, yes. Yeah, yep. it was actually the same year when that the light station was established. Yep. So that first lighthouse was about 30 feet tall. And if it was still standing today, it would be like right under where the Blue Water Bridge is. It was at the northeast corner of Fort Gratiot. So that's how actually how we got our name. We were the light at Fort Gratiot and it became Fort Gratiot Light Station. Yep. Makes sense. Yeah. So again, the, the original lighthouse was established in 1825, but it lasted only about three years. So how, how come it uh, lasted for such a short time? Yeah. So the 1820s in general was not a great time for lighthouses. Things were not done terribly well. There was yep. not a lot of quality control. Um, any fan of lighthouse history can tell you exactly why. And his name was Stephen Pleasanton, right? Well, um, yeah. yeah, I feel bad for him sometimes because people uh, make him out to be a villain. He was basically basically doing his job and just keeping the, yeah. the budget for our lighthouses as low as possible. But, yeah. He was absolutely just doing his job, but mm-hmm. sometimes it didn't work out well. No, um, you're absolutely right. So that first lighthouse, um, there's another quote from Alexander Thompson, the commanding officer at the fort uh, just next door. And he says, quote, the destruction of the former lighthouse was principally caused by the infamous manner in which it was constructed, having been mostly built of round stones and wretched cement or mortar, which is a pretty good description of it. It was just poorly built. It was built on the bank of a very swiftly moving river. Um, it was damaged in a storm in 19, 1828 and just kind of fell over. But it's OK, actually, that that didn't last very long because it was in a bad place. Its original location was actually, there's another quote from Alexander Thompson. The lighthouse that was blown down a few days since was almost totally useless from its having been improperly placed some distance down the mouth of the river so that it could not be seen in Lake Huron, but for a very short distance. As the land and woods hid it from view until vessels got almost upon it, it was no guide to vessels until they had in fact almost made the harbor without its assistance. Mm -hmm. It was also too low. (laughs) (laughs) That's his quote. And so it was in a bad place. It's not visible. It was too short. It was poorly built. So it's okay. It fell down after three years. Um, the current light, lighthouse built in 1829 was about twice the height. Mm-hmm. And it's a little bit further north. So you can see it for about seven miles. You yeah. can see the tower itself for about seven miles out on the lake. Mm-hmm. And it's built much to- more useful. Yeah. <laughs> it's a brick tower, of course. It's brick. Yep. Anything uh, about anybody involved, the uh, engineer or architect uh, involved in building this lighthouse that's worthy of note? The original tower was, the building contract was given to Winslow Lewis, right. who and then subcontracted it from a, um, a firm in Rochester, New York. Yeah. So again, I don't think there was much quality control there. They yeah. just didn't keep an eye on it. Well, Winslow Lewis seemed to uh, have the ear of Stephen Pleasant, who you mentioned earlier. So exactly. So Lewis yeah. got a lot, of, a lot of gigs that way. Yep. Yeah. But what about the uh, the current tower? Yeah, the current tower was built by uh, Lucius Lyon, who actually became Michigan's first senator. Oh. Sort of. He was senator in 1835. Michigan didn't become a state until 1837, so he was kind of a, a silent senator, I guess. Huh. Um, but he was uh, he was one of our senators. Okay. Well, that's really interesting. Cool. So in the early days, so back in the 1820s, when the light station was, was first established, it, it must have been considered very isolated, I would think. Uh, those uh, early keepers and families were probably kind of like pioneers in that area. <laughs> uh, yes and no. It's all relative. <laughs> yeah. By the 1820s, uh, Michigan was starting to open up for, you know, settlers a little bit more than it had in the past. Yeah. Um, but you have to think that 
lighthouse, our first lighthouse was at the corner of a fort. I mean, there were, that's probably a hundred people right yeah. there. There were uh, farming families of European American descent who had farmsteads here. Right. Um, so yes, it's a frontier, but also there are people around. One of the jobs for the soldiers was actually creating some of this infrastructure like roads. They were building those, they were clearing forests. So it depends on who you ask, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to remember like there are boats coming through here. It's not like you were completely cut off from civilization. Sure. And Detroit is a real city by that point, And it's, you know, 60 miles away. You're yeah, not going to walk yeah. that, but it's, you know, just down the river. Right. Um, so it's not completely cut off from the rest of the world. It might be a little harder than living in Detroit, but it's not, it's not the UP. Yeah. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I completely understand. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. So yeah. it depends on what you compare it to, of course. Yes. Uh, so I understand uh, there was an assistant keeper assigned to the station eventually after a, a fog signal was added. I think that was in the early 1870s. Yes. And for a while, I believe there was also a, another a second assistant keeper. So obviously you had a, a lot of principal keepers and assistant keepers and their families living there over the years. There must be some interesting personalities maybe in the history of the light station <laughs> and or interesting incidents concerning uh, life there. Anything that really stands out for you? So unfortunately, we don't know a ton about our keepers. Uh, we have a list of names, which doesn't tell me a lot about them. But I do know our first keeper, George McDougall, there's another good quote about him. This actually came from the History of Detroit, which was a, uh, a publication. It's kind of like a who's who of, of the city. And he's described as, um, well, he was a lawyer, a sheriff, justice of the peace, judge of probate, lighthouse keeper at St. Clair, owner of Belle Isle. And he was, he's described as of a roving disposition and erratic and sometimes quarrelsome. Hmm. So I would like to have known him. <laughs> yeah. um, I can't imagine he made a very good lighthouse keeper. But from what I've gathered from just reading our uh, our keepers logs, which only start in 1871, unfortunately, mm -hmm. you get to know the keepers a little bit just based on their what they're writing and their idiosyncrasies, you know. So there's uh, John Sinclair yeah. and his son uh, in the 1880s. One of them wrote you know, the names of every single visitor that came to the lighthouse huh. and just things like that. You want more information and they just don't give it to you. <laughs> well, that's, that's more than some wrote. Of course, in a lot of uh, keepers laws, you just have the, a daily weather report, like, you know, sure. or yeah. sunny and breezy the, or something. Uh, mm -hmm. The keeper after the Sinclairs, Israel T. Palmer, it was literally just weather reports. So yeah. That's not helpful. <laughs> yeah. uh, but then after that, we had Keeper Kimball, who I think was one of our longest lighthouse keepers. And he wrote one word, two words, maybe mm. every other day, cleaning in the tower, <laughs> yeah. cleaning, routine work done. Like, this is not helpful. And unfortunately, uh, he was keeper during one of the biggest weather events on the Great Lakes ever. Um, in 1913, there was the uh, storm of 1913. We call it the White Hurricane or the Big Blow. Of course, we don't have hurricanes here in the Great Lakes. But this one, the winds were so high that it was actually considered hurricane force winds. Okay. Um, and it came across Lake Superior, down Lake Huron, like straight down Lake Huron. So think about all the time, the momentum it has to build up from north to south. Mm -hmm. um, right here at the bottom of Lake Huron was pretty much the worst of it. Keeper Kimball said later in a, a newspaper report that the waves were 40 feet tall. Wow. And they were washing up on shore, washing the um, sand from around the foundation of the lighthouse. He said that that storm had lasted another hour. The tower would not be standing anymore. Mm. So there's this incredible storm, dozen shipwrecks. There's a shipwreck like right outside the lighthouse. It's upside down. It was floating there for three days. The man writes one sentence. <laughs> in the keeper's log like really <laughs> yeah that was the one date i wanted lots and lots of detail <laughs> yeah and you say there was a big storm <laughs> right the keeper after him wrote paragraphs of every little thing they did um so just these different methods of record keeping i guess is interesting yeah 
that I can't help uh, but mentioning. It reminds me of uh, there was the great hurricane of 1938, the worst hurricane in recorded New England history. Uh, over 700 people died, and including seven people at lighthouses in that storm. The keeper at Boston Light in Boston Harbor, you know, America's oldest light station, he and an assistant keeper actually spent the night at the top of the lighthouse because the door at the bottom blew off. And so wind was rushing up through the tower and they had to sit on the trap door at the top of the lantern room to keep it closed and also make sure the light stayed on overnight. <laughs> In the yeah. log, all he wrote was uh, something about a storm with high winds. And that's about it. You know, just a few words, <laughs> uh, very much like what you're saying. So come on a little yeah. bit more. I think these keepers just felt like they didn't want to the, sound like they were bragging or something about the, the job they did. I they, guess. They, they I don't know. Yeah. If I could go back in time, though. I'd go back to Kimball and be like, hey, can you write a little bit more, please? <laughs> yeah. So uh, anything else about life there? And uh, is anything recorded about the families there, the kids or anything like that? Not much? Not much. Uh, like I said, the Sinclairs mentioned some of their children. He mentions uh, a daughter, Grace, who's married the local reverend from the Methodist Church. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of stuff's kind of cool. But they don't, we don't have a lot of information on them. Yeah. Um, that's one of my next big research projects Projects is doing some genealogy on yeah. these guys because we don't know anything about them. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, that is unfortunate. I hope you find something more. It's not un that unusual either. Often sure. for any given light station, you might have one or two keepers who just uh, were more into recording, you know, either keeping a journal, you know, personal journal or recording things they did or somebody in the family maybe wrote a lot of letters or kept a diary or whatever, but not always the case. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't found that yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, and this is a fairly new historic site. Mm -hmm. So we only opened to the public 10 years ago in 2012. Right. And this is only my sixth summer here. So there was never anyone before me that did any serious research on this stuff. So right. that stuff may be out there somewhere and I just haven't found it yet. Yeah. Well, if anybody's going to find it, it's going to be you. I, I'm I don't sure know. About. <laughs> yeah. So I, I wish you good luck with that. Thank so you. you have a very complete light station there. There's the tower, two keepers houses, right? And various outbuildings is probably, I noticed, uh, one of the things I noticed visiting Michigan Lighthouses recently, unlike New England, the privies survive at most of these places, which is kind of, kind of. I didn't actually realize that. So you probably have, have that in addition to uh, how many buildings in all on the site? Oh, you're going to make me count them. Well, <laughs> probably in the neighborhood of seven or eight, I would guess, something yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to say six and a half. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that's not counting the hospital from the fort that you mentioned Correct. earlier. That's, that is uh, not technically part of the light station. Yeah. Yeah. When people visit there, do they get to go in multiple buildings? Yeah. Um, so we do guided tours. It'll take you into our fog signal building. Unfortunately, all the really cool machinery is gone. That was scrapped in the 70s. Um, you get to go into the keeper's duplex, which has been restored to the 1930s. And then you get to go, of course, in, into the tower. Some of our other buildings include the uh, Coast Guard Equipment Building. It's a four-bay garage, basically. And that is where our museum store is. And then you get your tickets for the tour and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the Coast Guard Cruise Quarters, um, which is in the process of being restored. And there's a single keeper's dwelling that was built in 1932. That's mm -hmm. the county park's office now. I was reading that there, there's actually a, a separate group called the Friends of the Fort Gratiot Light. What does that group do? Um, so they're a fundraiser arm for us, basically. They do um, various events. For example, they host the Blue Water Sand Fest, which is a huge fundraiser every summer. And they do various other things. They gather volunteers to do like work bees for the restoration. And really what they do is raise money to support the restoration of all these buildings. As I said, we opened to the public in 2012, but before that County parks took possession of all the, of the grounds and the buildings in 2010. And in 2011, they had to restore the tower. Uh, they had to replace like 30,000 bricks on the outside of the tower. So the friends of the Fort Gratiot light station raised the money or helped raise the money at least 
uh, to pay for these restoration projects. Mm-hmm. We're about halfway through a 25 year plan of restoration. So oh, okay. we got more to go. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Is there anything slated for the near future? Anything that'll be happening restoration wise? Yeah. So that uh, Coast Guard cruise quarters that I mentioned uh, is the next big restoration project. Uh, it got a new roof a couple of years ago and they were really starting to do some of the demolition inside and pull up staples from the floor and that kind of stuff. And then COVID hit. Um, so we had to put a pause on that, but hopefully um, with our uh, Blue Water Sand Fest again this summer, we'll raise lots and lots of money and we can continue with that restoration project. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually it'll be bunk space for our overnight program. So it'll be an exhibit space and hopefully classroom space as well. It's a big building. <laughs> okay. And is there some work uh, that's going to be happening on the tower as well? Yes. Um, So the county parks got the Michigan Lighthouse Assistance Program grant um, from the state of Michigan. And they are doing a restoration project in the lantern room of the tower. So the very top. Yep. Um, One thing to keep in mind is that this was an active Coast Guard station until about 2004. So they did a lot of not necessarily historic preservation things. (laughs) Yeah. And in the lantern room, like they had put a plywood floor down between the watch room and the lantern room so that they could get up there to work on the lights. There was a plywood drop ceiling, plexiglass windows. It was, it's bad. Um, So the county parks are up there doing restoration. They took out all that plywood, really opened up the top of the lantern room. So you can see the, the vent at the top, you know, they're going to replace some of the, air vents so they're like actual nice shiny brass working mm. air vents yep. um, replace the windows with actual glass and we are still an active lighthouse so eventually you'll be able to climb to the top of the tower look up through a glass floor and see our light at the top oh cool yeah do visitors get to go up into the lantern room it sounds like not no mm-hmm. um because we are still an active lighthouse and the light itself is owned and maintained by the Coast Guard, that's government property, so we can't allow the public up there, unfortunately. But the yeah. beauty of this restoration project is that it does open it up so you'll be able to at least see what the light looks like. And what is the optic that's there now? It is a Vega light. Uh, it's an LED about the size of a five-gallon yep. bucket. Yep. It's not terribly impressive, if yeah. you ask me. But I'm very familiar it with it. Functions. <laughs> yeah, a, a VLB 44, I think it would be. Yeah. 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 It has multiple rings, like. Yep. Yeah, completely automated. It's boring. It just flashes on and off yeah. every six seconds. <laughs> they do the job, but they're not. They do all that uh, interesting, really. Yeah. 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 So uh, another thing I was I was reading about recently that kind of piqued my interest is the fact that there was an archaeology dig there. I think it was in 2019. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. So the whole process actually started back in 2016. Central Michigan University came out uh, with one of the grad student classes, which I was in. It was a lot of fun. Uh, We came out and did what are called shovel test pits. Um, So basically you're digging 20 inch deep holes in a grid pattern across the entire site. And that kind of gives you an idea of where you might find specific things uh, like a foundation of a house or privy or something like that. And it was deemed at that point that this is a great candidate to be an archaeological site. Mm -hmm. Um, So then in 2019, uh, the CMU field school came back and did, I think it was a nine week course where uh, college students did an actual archaeological dig here. Uh, And they did two locations. They found uh, one of the original privies, so it was kind of neat to see them do it because there's this, you can tell there was a a brick foundation, and inside it was all very dark, really nice, rich soil, and then immediately outside it's beach sand. Mm -hmm. So like, oh, yep, that's where the privy was. Okay. Um, And the other location they did was actually the site of our first keeper's dwelling. Mm -hmm. So when the new tower was built in 1829 they built a house to go with it was just a single family dwelling cool there were rumors that it burned down after a christmas tree fire at Mm -hmm. christmas time that's an urban legend they found no evidence of fire we think it was probably just torn down and then replaced with the 1874 keepers duplex so when we got that second keeper with the fog signal building they needed a house for two keepers 
So they built that the duplex there. Speaking of archaeology, I was just wondering, there, there must be a very rich uh, Native American history of the site. Is there anything related to that that's been found on the site? Yeah. So uh, the CMU Field School found a few pieces of evidence, um, some lithic flakes from flint snapping, uh, that kind of stuff, some late woodland pottery. So just before pre-contact to contact period pottery. Mm-hmm. Yes, there is a, a rich Native American history here. We actually work pretty closely with some of the local indigenous groups. Uh, we're going to host a powwow here on the grounds in August. Oh, uh, good. So that'll be that'll be pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and then elsewhere through town, there's been uh, some excavations done. Uh, for example, just south of us at uh, Draper Park, a city park, they found incredible clay vase. Uh, hmm. That's actually on display at the Carnegie Center now. It's huge, uh, just really, really cool. Uh, so yeah, there's a, a long history of that, and they are still here, and we work with them to to share their history. Yeah. So if we could get back a little bit to the the experience of visiting there, okay? When people do come to visit, are there guided tours available? Yes. As I said, this is a county park, so you can come in, walk the grounds whenever you like. Uh, but we do guided tours. During the summer, we're open seven days a week. Um, you come in to the Four Bay Garage, the Coast Guard Equipment Building. Uh, you talk to me, get your tickets, and then um, you'll go on a guided tour. It's about 45 minutes long. It takes you around the grounds. Our knowledgeable docents will tell you all the history, uh, take you into the Fog Signal Building, the Keeper's House, and then, of course, you get to climb the tower as well. If you're really lucky, there's a freighter passing when you're at the top. Cool. Yeah. So you mentioned the docents. Are, are the docents managed by by you through the Port Huron Museums? Or, yep. Or, yep. yep. Mm-hmm. They're uh, part of our volunteers. And honestly, we couldn't run this site without them. They are invaluable. Yeah. You have volunteers working in the gift shop also? Yeah. We could always use more volunteers, though. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. There's a lot of that going around. Yeah. And it, it hasn't gotten any easier the last couple of years, I'm sure, for, for you Absolutely. and many other organizations. Yeah. We have some very dedicated ones who are here every week. Um, mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a big help, for sure. Yeah. Since we're on that subject, uh, you say you can always use more volunteers. You have a website, of course, and uh, which, which is, what is the, the website for the Lighthouse? PortHuronMuseums.org. PortHuronMuseums.org. And there must be contact info on there if there's anybody. There's, yep, yeah. there's some contact info on there. Mm-hmm. Um, there's You can fill out a volunteer application right there online. You can give us a call. Yep. Um, talk to one of our friendly, uh, friendly staff members. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook. That's a good way to keep up to date with everything that we're doing at all of our sites. Yeah. Is the Facebook uh, page Port Huron Museums, or is there one specifically for Fort Gratiot Light Station? Nope, it's just Port Huron Museums, the one uh, one Facebook page. Yep, okay. Do you have a presence on other social media as well? We have an Instagram too, but it's not as active. Yeah, yeah. It's it's hard. It takes it takes a lot of work <laughs> yeah. to keep those things super active. It's a uh, lot of work and we're a very small staff. Yeah, so. I couldn't understand more. So uh, you mentioned the Blue Water Sand Fest a couple of times. Can you say a little bit more about what that is? It sounds really, really neat. Yeah. Uh, so the Blue Water Sand Fest is a weekend long event. We have like professional sand carvers. I didn't know this was a thing until I started working here. Yeah. Um, but professional like artists they really are artists come in they get they bring in 500 tons of sand put it in great big piles and these sand carvers just create amazing pieces of artwork yeah out of sand and it's a it's like i said a big fundraiser for us uh you can come in they are working all weekend and then by sunday they have completed sculptures so they can compete for uh prize money status i guess yeah Uh, you can vote for your favorite. It's it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have a similar uh, festival or competition here. I live in the New Hampshire seacoast in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, at the at Hampton Beach, which is a major, you know, tourist uh, attraction. Uh, there's an annual sandcastle competition in, in June. I'll bet some of the same people are probably uh, 
I'm we'll sure. probably enter both. It seems to be a fairly small number of people who travel around and do these competitions, and they are absolutely amazing. But there's more to the festival than just the uh, the sand sculptures, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, so this year, there's a, a couple new additions. Uh, they're going to be doing uh, a craft and vendor show. There's going to be there's always food trucks. There's beer tent, cornhole tournaments, and of course, you can climb the tower as well. Mm-hmm. That's always part of it. So yeah, that it's sounds- going to be big this year. We had to cancel it for the past two years due to COVID, obviously. Yeah. Um, so we're coming back bigger and better this year. It sounds like a lot of fun. So in addition to the Blue Water Sand Fest, you mentioned the powwow you're going to be having Mm -hmm. also. Are there any other events planned for this coming season? Yeah. So in early June, we have um, Friends of the St. Clair River hosting the Sturgeon Festival here. Uh, If you haven't seen a sturgeon before, oh boy. (laughs) They are an ugly, ugly fish. They're kind of prehistoric. They They are. are They are absolutely prehistoric. They're like a freshwater shark, basically. Yeah. Uh, but they're bottom feeders. They're completely harmless, but they can grow up to like six feet long and live for hundreds of years. Yeah. They're really incredible. Um, they were a major food source here on the Great Lakes for Native Americans for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, but as you can imagine, with all the environmental impacts that we've had over the past 200 years, their population has really declined. But they're, they are coming back. And so the Sturgeon Festival is kind of celebrating that um, right under the Blue Water Bridge here is actually a breeding ground for sturgeon. So Mm -hmm. um, the DNR will actually like pull probably a teenage uh, sturgeon out of the water Hmm. and put it in a little tank for the day so you can come look at it. They're incredible. And they actually don't have scales, which is kind of weird. They're completely smooth like a shark. It's it's interesting. Yeah. Um, so I'm really excited to have that back this year uh, on the grounds. And then, as I mentioned, Sandfest and the powwow in August. We also have the, um, the float down, which is an interesting event here in town. It's not sanctioned by anyone. It's not organized by any one group or individual. It just happens. Okay. Um, local residents here will grab anything that floats. I've seen... Uh, Picnic tables on plastic barrels float down the river. I've seen inflatable unicorns and flamingos. I've seen dollar store rafts. Don't do that. Don't float down on one of those. Um, But they'll launch from right here in front of the lighthouse and float down the St. Clair River for about eight miles to Marysville. Um, It's a huge event. Like I said, no one organizes it. It just happens. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> sounds dangerous, but it sounds like a lot it of fun. It is incredibly dangerous. Like yeah. I said, this is one of the swiftest moving rivers in the world. Right. There are rapids under the river, and you're just going to float down on an air mattress. Okay. Yeah. Um, there was one year where it was a beautiful day, gorgeous, perfect day to float down. People started floating, and then the wind shifted suddenly and blew 1,500 drunk Americans over to Canada. <laughs> It was embarrassing. It was very embarrassing. It made international news. It was on BBC. Huh. The Canadians wow. were nice enough to just put them all on a bus and send them back. Because <laughs> of Canadian course you don't point. have <laughs> you don't yeah. have your passport or driver's license or money or anything. Uh, so they just kind of side rolled their eyes and sent them back. Yeah, Canadians. <laughs> that hasn't to, happened since. Originally. They tend to be very polite and forgiving. I think. Of, yeah. For the most part of us us Americans. Um, yeah, that reminds me of my wife uh, grew up in a, in a river town in Connecticut on the Farmington River. She grew up tubing, as they called it, you know, riding an inner tube down the river. So I think she would enjoy that festival. She got she got me to do that one time and the water was a lot faster than I was expecting. And there were more rocks and shallow water than I was expecting. So one once was more than enough for me. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, it also reminds me that there's a, a pumpkin boat festival in uh, Damariscotta, Maine, in the kind of mid-coast Maine, where people carve out giant pumpkins and squash and, and race uh, on the river in them, which <laughs> is pretty I feel pretty like that would be entertaining. <laughs> yeah, uh, it'd be fun if somebody tried that in your, your area. They You can't steer them at all, of course. They just right. go where they want to go. But anyway, I digress. So, I don't think we need any more bad ideas here. <laughs> 
Right, right. It sounds like people have plenty of bad ideas on their own with that that one. But yeah. it sounds like there's a lot a lot of neat stuff going on around there. And I'm sorry I didn't make it to Fort Gratiot, uh, the area and the lighthouse on this uh, trip I just made to Michigan. But I'm hoping to get back there next year, maybe see uh, some different parts of the, the state, more of the lighthouses. Yeah. So I hope I'll be able to visit there next year. Absolutely have to come back and visit the east side of the state. It gets... yeah. It doesn't get as much attention as the UP or the northern lower peninsula, you know, the Mackinac area, obviously, mm -hmm. or even the West Coast. People love the West Coast, unlike Michigan, but yeah. the East Side has a lot of really cool history. We have Michigan's oldest lighthouse. Come on. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. You're uh, making me want to... So you got to yeah. give the East Side a chance. Oh, of course. I, I promise I, I will. I, and I hope it's next year for sure. So I have one final question for you, okay, for bonus points. All right. So get okay. ready here. And the for uh, your bonus question, uh, what is your favorite thing about your work at the Fort Grash at Light Station? That is a great question. Sometimes I have to remind myself that not everyone works at a lighthouse every day. I kind of tend to forget that this is actually really cool. I enjoy giving those tours and, you know, seeing people make the connections in their head about maybe they're from the East Coast and they've been to a lighthouse before and then they see how similar ours is and the similarities and the differences. Or, you know, maybe they're locals that have never been here before, you know, seeing how their understanding of history connects to, to the lighthouse and just making those connections. Probably my favorite part of the job. I, I totally understand. Uh, giving tours is probably my favorite thing of all the various lighthouse related activities I'm involved in. Making that connection is, is so important. So, uh, Lauren Nelson, thank you so much. This is, is really fascinating. You're, you're a great spokesperson for the, the site there. And uh, it's obvious you, you love the work you do and uh, you're the right person in the right position there. So, and I <laughs> well, appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Yeah. I appreciate you so much uh, spending this time with me today and hope to talk with you again. Thank you, Lauren. Absolutely. Thank you. To learn more about Fort Gratiot Light Station, visit the Port Huron Museum's website at phmuseum.org. In addition to the events that were discussed in the interview, there's a sea shanty event coming up on June 10th aboard the Huron Lightship. It's a chance to enjoy live nautical music, have some snacks, and raise a glass of rum on board the last lightship on the Great Lakes. Sounds pretty cool. It does. <laughs> I'd love to, <laughs> love to go to that. Right? I do hope to visit both Fort Gratiot Light Station and the Huron Lightship on a trip to Michigan next year. I just uh, got to a, uh, got to visit a bunch of lighthouses in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, uh, a little bit in the uh, Lower Peninsula too, and also over in Minnesota, the Duluth area, a few weeks ago. And some of the interviews I did on that trip will be heard in upcoming episodes of this podcast. Our thanks, as always, to all the members, volunteers, and staff of the U.S. Lighthouse Society at Point No Point in Washington and around the world. Check out uslhs.org to learn more about all the things the Society offers, including the overnight accommodations at the Point No Point and Point Wilson light stations in Washington. I've stayed in the Keeper's House at Point No Point, and I loved it. Mm. Remember that donations and memberships in the U.S. Lighthouse Society help support this podcast. If you listen to the podcast using Apple Podcasts or any platform that allows you to post reviews, please rate and review us. The American psychologist and philosopher William James once wrote, quote, We are like islands in the sea, separate on the surface, but connected in the deep, unquote. Next week's episode of Lighthearted will feature an interview with Steve Sola, owner of the Duluth South Breakwater Inner Lighthouse in Minnesota, and also an interview with Marilyn Fisher of the Selshwa Lighthouse uh, in uh, Michigan. Uh, those are two places that I visited on my recent trip. I enjoyed them both very much. As always, to all our regular listeners and to our new ones, thanks so much for listening and keep a good light. Let it shine. Shine, let it shine, let it shine.
Let it shine, let it shine